Kia ora everyone and welcome to this Goodfellow webinar on the place for medical cannabis and how to prescribe. My name is Dr Grace Lee, I'm a GP in Auckland and I also work for the Goodfellow unit. Tonight I have with me Dr Graham Gilbranson who is a cannabis consultant, GP and addiction specialist from Cannabis Care in Auckland. Welcome Graham. Now Graham, what got you interested in medical cannabis? Thanks Grace. Look I've got some numbers for you. Uh, I've been a GP for the last 35 years and continue to practice as such. I work as an addiction specialist for the last 10 years mm -hmm. and I've been prescribing medicinal cannabis for about two years. I've prescribed CBD to over 600 patients now. And really over the decades I've talked to patients about their drug use and over and over people have said I use cannabis because mm -hmm. it helps me sleep it helps me relax and it's the only thing that works for pain. Sure. And as GPs, we know, we learn from our patients, we listen to our patients. And uh, since then I've attended 10 international conferences on medicinal cannabis. And really from my own experience, I know that it works for a lot of people, not for everyone, but it can be very effective. Tēnā koutou katoa, thanks for joining us. First, I've got no disclosures apart from my own medical practice, cannabis care. I don't have shares in any cannabis company. Tonight, I'll take you through a brief background to medical cannabis, how to prescribe, and on slide 29, I've got an example of uh, an easy prescription just to get you started, because I know that's one of the hardest things. How do I do for my first script? So uh, I've got that there for you. And then I'll finish, uh, if we've got time, by uh, covering uh, an audit of 400 CBD patients last year, hopefully to be written up by Professor Bruce Arrell. And thanks, Bruce, for getting me along here for this webinar. Right, uh, I'm interested to know who's prescribed CBD, and that's uh, partly in response to this article in the Herald earlier this month and uh, it says that GPs have often been asked by patients about it and uh, most of us as GPs don't feel that well informed. So we've got a question for you, a yes no question. Yeah, so thanks if you could uh, tick the box, let us know uh, how many of you have prescribed CBD? We don't have time on this presentation to ask who's prescribed THC but uh, I'm curious to know uh, who has prescribed Sativex. So we, we're watching your responses as they come in and uh, thank you for those who are clicking on the poll, just answer yes or no. And uh, I know that uh, around the country, there's a, a peppering of GPs who are responding to calls from patients and uh, in my own practice, I see patients face to face, often self-referred. Uh, many are coming now with referral letters from GPs and that's very much appreciated. But uh, a lot of people are not able to get to my practice and I'm doing video consults around the country. So how's it looking there, Grace? We've got, got about 75% have voted so far. Right, okay, well, well thank you for that. I think uh, we need to move on and uh, what it tells us is 9% of those who have voted have prescribed CBD. So thanks for responding. Here we go, we're back online. So uh, uh, yeah, let's start with this. Uh, it's not usually smoked as a joint. Uh, and here's uh, an example of the only product that is available for prescription. It comes as an oil, but uh, around the world, uh, lozenges, capsules, oral sprays, vaping devices, topical balms, these are all uh, options elsewhere. The good news and the bad news, all doctors may prescribe CBD for any condition. That's fantastic and that's rather unusual around the world. And for GPs out there, I suggest that chronic pain or emotional distress are a good place to start. However, it's not in your MIMS or NZF, so you'll need to handwrite your prescriptions or add it manually to your PMS. Let's talk about uh, the main ingredients in cannabis plants, THC and CBD. So uh, you'll see on the screen there that uh, uh, THC 
is uh, um, a euphoriant, it's the intoxicant. If you want to get stoned off cannabis, you want plenty of THC. Uh, balanced products uh, contain equal amounts of THC, CBD, uh, have therapeutic benefits, and we'll talk about Sativex later. CBD dominant, this is what we can prescribe, CBD, and uh, it's really for therapeutic value. You won't get high from CBD. And uh, plants, uh, cannabis plants are a bit like uh, tomatoes, grapes, etc. There are those that are abundant in THC and those that are abundant in CBD and uh, those in the middle. And uh, I've got some examples here. In the Netherlands, uh, you can get uh, plant cannabis uh, for medicinal use. Bedrocan is 22% THC, very little CBD. The balanced product is pretty much equal THC and CBD. And uh, Bedro Light is CBD only, 9% CBD and 1% THC. Uh, in the Netherlands, they know that cannabis being smoked is not associated with lung cancer, and this is the best way to absorb your cannabis. So it's the most cost effective, and they can buy plant material. In uh, New Zealand, we are pretty much restricted to the drops that I told you about. For those using illicit cannabis, uh, this is from police seizures, where the average content is uh, of THC is 15%. This is because uh, that's cost effective if you want to get people stoned. And 85% uh, of uh, police samples of recreational cannabis showed practically zero CBD, which is what we can prescribe. So very low there, very unbalanced. And uh, so THC is the euphoriant, it sedates, it's an analgesic. So it's got medicinal purposes and the CBD is the one that we've got. Anxiolytic, antipsychotic, anticonvulsant, uh, and many other properties that we'll go over. Concerns that people raise, psychosis, schizophrenia. Well, we're prescribing CBD, which does not cause those things. In fact, uh, some studies have shown CBD to be antipsychotic, and uh, 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 low THC it means that there's really no risk of schizophrenia or psychosis. Addiction risk, again, most unlikely with CBD because THC is the euphoriant. That's where uh, the risk of dependence. And uh, we're really talking about medicinal and there's no data on dependence for medicinal. And in children, well, CBD is the non-euphoriant, the non-addictive part, and uh, it's going to be safe for all age groups. And I've prescribed it widely in children. THC may also be appropriate in children for severe conditions. And let's uh, talk about a severe condition here. Uh, really, just my own case history tonight. Kira's a three-year-old in the South Island with a rare genetic condition uh, involving seizures where standard medical treatments have not helped her. And uh, in this year, 2019, her seizures have reduced from 30 a day to five a day on CBD. I've given her 15 milligrams per kilogram. She's a three-year-old weighing just 10 kilos. And uh, uh, so uh, fantastic result there. And here's the response back from her mother. Hi, we're doing fantastically. Kira's on 10 milligrams per kilogram per day, having less than 12 seizures a week. Uh, it's been great. Child Development Services and her physio are amazed at how much of an impact, and she's able to do a lot more like swimming, making eye contact, starting to eat food, as well as reach out for objects. Uh, every day of her life is a whole lot easier. We're truly thankful we were given the opportunity to have Tilray see her thrive. Thank you again. Seriously ill children, CBD is a very safe medicine and high doses are needed, 10 milligrams per kilogram per day, but a fantastic result and the image there is of her eating an ice cream and she's been mainly tube fed and this is a major turnaround and a big excitement and she continues to do well. I need to be careful what I say, section 29 says that no person shall advertise the availability of any medicine to which this section applies. It makes it very difficult for me to talk about prescribing medicinal cannabis if I can't advertise the availability. So we need to be careful, perhaps we need to be sensible on this, and uh, 
I, I run the risk of getting into trouble with the Ministry of Health by giving this presentation. How much sense is that? What are the chemicals in cannabis? Well, THC is the euphoriant. CBD is the one that we can all prescribe and uh, that uh, has uh, a wide range of uh, therapeutic uses and uh, there are over 140 identified cannabinoids in the plant. Most are not psychoactive, whereas uh, the THC is. Uh, each uh, of these different cannabinoids has its own properties. And then there are terpenes. These are the aromatics. And uh, if you think of uh, uh, the uh, different uh, uh, flavorings in, in foods, the natural flavorings, and these are the terpenes, and uh, they have therapeutic benefits as well. And uh, the whole lot together is called the entourage effect. So the whole plant works much more strongly than single molecules. However, in this country, we're pretty much uh, uh, restricted to CBD or pure uh, THC in combination. And uh, the, the Ministry of Health isn't allowing the other items. Uh, but there are many other components in cannabis and uh, they've uh, been identified over a hundred different components there. So what's the evidence? Well, there's abundant evidence and we've not got time to cover the whole thing tonight. Uh, but ask your patients what they use and uh, what the outcome is. Biological plausibility. This relates to the endocannabinoid system and I've called it a neuroimmunohomeostasis signaling system. So it's present in all vertebrates, uh, from sea squirts uh, to humans, and in bold there, cannabinoid receptors are present throughout the body, embedded in cell membranes, and are believed to be more numerous than any other receptor system. They're quietly there in the background getting on with their job and uh, have only recently by, been identified uh, because in most people, they're not problematic. Uh, how do we understand them? CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptors, uh, in the brain, uh, different parts of the brain, but uh, notably uh, uh, not in um, parts of the, the brain uh, controlling uh, respiration. And uh, uh, that means that in very high doses, you're, you're not going to get any respiratory depression from CBD. Uh, and you can see there that it uh, the normal function, modulating memory, mood, executive function, etc. Uh, a large role in the GI system, respiratory system, and the cannabinoid 1 receptors are widespread uh, through the body, and the CB2 receptors are more involved with the immune system, uh, and uh, they're also widely dispersed. But there are many other cannabinoid receptors in us and other animals. Uh, regulating many physiological processes, neurological, cardiovascular, stress. It's quietly getting on with things in the background, looking after our appetite, our sleep, our relaxing, our forgetfulness. Uh, uh, it protects uh, many systems there, and uh, we could have a whole lecture on that, but we need to move on here. Uh, the way I like to understand it from uh, Stahl's Essential Psychopharmacology when neuron A talks to B, to C, and so on, and uh, of course, uh, uh, they, they talk to many more than just single other neurons. Uh, when A talks to B, B sends a little signal back, a retrograde neurotransmission. This is almost unique. And uh, uh, B tells A, hey, I've got the message. You can stop sending now. And uh, we've got uh, uh, on the right of your screen in color, uh, so the neurotransmitter goes across. And then we've got this unique retrograde neurotransmission of our endogenous cannabinoids. And uh, also if uh, you're taking other plant cannabinoids, that goes back and that turns the signal off, it modulates. And uh, so on the bottom right of your screen in the green box, cannabinoids regulate neurotransmission. They stop that signal, and uh, that's really important in pain and seizures, anxiety, PTSD, and so many other areas where medicinal cannabis may be beneficial. So if you've got any patients who are stuck where conventional medicine's not working, 
Well, uh, all registered practitioners can prescribe CBD for any condition. It's a, a great opportunity. I think uh, chronic pain and anxiety are a good place to start. Uh, it's not in your software. You're going to have to add it manually. THC, on the other hand, is somewhat more difficult to prescribe. Patients will tell me, I don't want to get high. And this is people with chronic pain, uh, nausea, insomnia, anxiety. And uh, that's an interesting thing about CBD. You won't get high from it. It's a non-euphoriant with, uh, I think, no risk of dependence. Uh, this is coming from an addiction specialist. Uh, uh, widely therapeutic, very few adverse effects. And uh, look, I think every stuck patient deserves a chance to try it. And we don't have a chance tonight to go through all the indications, but let's look at some of them. I've uh, looked at six different ways to prescribe, and uh, in fact, there are a few others as well. So let's start with CBD products and uh, uh, look this up if you like. So you can Google on the Ministry of Health website uh, uh, approvals to prescribe cannabis based products and uh, uh, you'll find the PDF there, and it's a useful flowchart. It might take you some time to get your head around it, but let's just look at some of it. Uh, so, uh, first of all, with regard to CBD, uh, uh, since September 2017, all doctors can prescribe CBD for any product without approval. However, when it comes to THC, anything with more than 2% THC requires uh, a specialist application. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, somewhat difficult to understand why specialists would know more about it than we would. The regulations are quite complicated. So let's uh, look at uh, the pretty much the only product uh, at this point uh, at the end of, uh, which one's the weird? April. April 2018, 17, where are we? God. 2019. 19, yes, try and keep up, Graham. Okay, um, look, uh, it's, it's been available for a little while, and uh, this is my uh, standard prescription, and we'll just leave that on screen for a minute. You're going to have to set that up in your database or handwrite your prescription. So uh, uh, it comes... Uh, in this sort of container, it's a 25 ml bottle, and uh, this is my prescription. Take quarter of a ml early evening and increase as directed. And I put the name of the contact person. The pharmacy has to get that in. And uh, look, I highly recommend it, uh, the electronic prescription service and barcoded scripts. It's a fantastic system. So uh, there's the item, there's the prescription, and uh, I've uh, just uh, Put it there again for your information. This is my standard starting prescription, CBD oil. I use the stronger prescription. The uh, It comes in two strengths, but really it's the 100 milligrams per mil that's more likely to have benefit. And uh, standard prescription form, it doesn't need to be on a controlled drug form. And uh, uh, the CBD costs uh, about uh, $300, $350 at the pharmacy for a, a small bottle there and uh, 25 mils at uh, 25 milligrams a night as the starting dose. And uh, patients can gradually build that up and uh, we've got a dosing schedule here. So uh, really early on, it might be quarter of a mil, which is 25 milligrams at night moving to twice daily dosing and bit by bit. And uh, I've found that a lot of patients uh, seem to benefit on something like uh, 50 milligrams twice a day. I actually step it up faster than this because it's very safe medicine. Uh, it, the little dropper bottle can be kept out of the fridge, hold it under the tongue, sublingual absorption uh, may increase the absorption before patients swallow it. Uh, and uh, some people need a higher dose than that. So uh, come back to this uh, for your dosing information or approach Tilray for a dosing schedule. And uh, just a little bit of information about CBD. It's non-euphoriant, non-intoxicating. It's well uh, identified to have anticonvulsant, anxiolytic, antipsychotic, neuroprotective properties. 
uh, can be analgesic. Uh, and uh, the doses that I've found, as I've said, 50 milligrams twice a day is often beneficial for a wide range of conditions. Drug interactions, very unlikely in practice. Clobazam, ketoconazole, I monitor INRs with warfarin. Uh, yeah, just look out for the usual suspects. Moving on again, um, so a little bit more about uh, uh, this time uh, Sativex spray. And uh, this is available as a little spray bottle uh, for spasms not managed by conventional medicine. And uh, uh, if there's a recommendation by a neurologist, any doctor can write a prescription for multiple sclerosis and it doesn't need any other approval. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if uh, you want to use it for unapproved use, and uh, I'll indicate a wide range of conditions there, uh, there's a two-page application form which needs to be signed by a GP and a specialist Look, I don't really understand this whole uh, business about this. Uh, I think GPs, uh, mature, experienced doctors, we should just be able to write prescriptions for something as benign as uh, Sativex or CBD. Uh, and uh, really, uh, uh, we prescribe much more serious medicines than this. Uh, here's the application form, a two-page form that you'll find online if you Google uh, MedSafe and Sativex. And how do we do Sativex? Well, Sativex is a combination of THC and CBD, and uh, you'll find this dosing sheet under MedSafe, uh, data sheets under Sativex, and uh, it's given as an oral spray, uh, starting slowly and building up. So this is the twice daily schedule, and you're just uh, increasing the dose bit by bit. I find a lot of patients uh, respond to a couple of doses in the evening, uh, but some will get right down to the maximum dose. Uh, and patients are paying um, uh, quite a lot for a little pack uh, with uh, three little spray bottles, and uh, that's uh, going to last them variably anywhere from one month to three or four months. Uh, and this is the thing about medicinal cannabis. We don't know the dose until people start it and try it. So this is the Sativex spray. Compassionate cannabis. Um, uh, actually, uh, was there something else to say uh, about uh, medicinal cannabis? Uh, yes, uh, let, let's just move on to compassionate cannabis. And what do I mean by this? This is, uh, people can't always afford medicinal cannabis on prescription. And so really I'm talking about illegal cannabis that people are using for therapeutic reasons. And on occasions people will grow their own or will access uh, cannabis from so-called green fairies. And uh, look, there's a wealth of wisdom in the community uh, and a lot of experience about which strains of cannabis work for which conditions. Doctors are only just catching up to what's uh, widely known out there in the community. However, this is illegal and uh, we don't often know what's in the particular cannabis that people are using uh, medicinally. Uh, we don't know the chemical profile or the strength or if there's contamination, even though it may work. Uh, and uh, many of us, uh, uh, many patients would uh, ask us to support uh, the referendum to legalize cannabis so that people can purchase safe standardized products from licensed outlets. And this is something that over and over patients are saying they would prefer legal medicine. Currently, the prescription items are very expensive. They are growing their own or purchasing their own, and uh, they want this to be legalized uh, so that what appears to be relatively safe medicine can be more widely used. Let's talk a little bit more, uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act. Uh, so uh, there is a defense for the terminally ill, as I've highlighted, to possess and use illicit cannabis. And uh, they may ask you for a medical certificate. And uh, in bold in the center there, you might be asked for a certificate. This is available online if you Google uh, medicinal cannabis certification. 
and state that this person has advanced progressive life limiting condition nearing the end of their life and that's for your judgment as a health practitioner uh, and that's something that I've written a few letters for and this allows people to use illegal cannabis uh, without uh, the risk of prosecution. Importing CBD, uh, this can uh, be done by doctors. It's complicated and expensive and uh, may involve various fees uh, uh, through customs on arrival in the country and isn't necessarily the easiest process. Uh, patients might ask you, can they import CBD? Well, they can if there's a package addressed to the patient and uh, accompanied by a prescription or a letter from a New Zealand registered doctor that matches the quantity, strength and form of the imported medicine. So some of us will be approached by patients and I've written the odd letter and uh, that uh, or prescription that needs to be included in the packet along with the certificate of analysis uh, and the right labelling. It's very complicated for, for something actually like CBD that's a fairly benign medicine compared to most of what we prescribe. Just to uh, talk briefly about uh, uh, an audit of uh, patients. Uh, I, I've looked at 400 patients that I saw last year and prescribed CBD and uh, we're hoping to write this up and uh, I've got them to tell me after three or four weeks was it no good, good, very good or excellent. This is GP grassroots research if you'll excuse the phrase. And uh, we also did a quality of life uh, questionnaire and uh, I've got Professor Bruce Errol to thank for his support with this. And look, this is uh, what we've found, uh, that uh, 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 patients are using it for pain, 46% of my 400 patients, for cancer symptoms, for emotional symptoms and neurological, and that's consistent with international literature. So. Look, half of patients will use it for pain. And what sort of pain? Well, I've looked at uh, 181 patients and I've kept a log, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, and you can see on the list there, these are common things that we see in general practice and uh, often they are not amenable to standard medical treatments or medical treatments come with adverse effects. and. Uh, also, you'll get patients who say, look, philosophically, I'd rather start with herbal medicine. And if that doesn't work, then go to standard treatments. And uh, uh, well, you may or may not support that notion, but uh, I think the adverse effect profile is very low with medicinal cannabis. And uh, perhaps in future, this is where we will be starting. So this is the sort of pain conditions I'm treating. And uh, this is uh, the sort of outcome that patients have reported at one month. Uh, excellent and very good, 30% uh, good. So quite a, a useful uh, a response at one month, no benefit and loss to follow up. But uh, hey, these are patients where nothing else has helped. They're willing to spend this sort of money and uh, a, a bottle costing, uh, uh, the patient, uh, well, the, the price keeps changing and you'll need to talk to your local pharmacy about the, the current price, uh, but uh, it is going down and hopefully we're going to see other options in future. But many people are prepared to pay for some CBD to get those sort of results. Cancer symptoms, uh, 92 of my patients in 2017 and uh, uh, so often advanced uh, with metastases uh, and all sorts of cancer and uh, again similar sorts of results, uh, a, a, a good proportion reported benefit. Emotional distress, really helpful with anxiousness and depression, insomnia, ADHD, premenstrual syndrome. Uh, look, these are stuck patients where none of our standard treatments are helping and CBD, cannabidiol, seems to be a very safe medicine for these sorts of problems. Neurological symptoms, 60 of my patients last year and I'm looking here at seizures, I'm looking at autism spectrum with challenging behaviour, I'm looking at Parkinson's with pain, chronic fatigue, uh, 
peripheral neuropathy, as you can see there. Now, it won't work for everyone, but the outcomes are very similar in all groups, uh, that we are seeing a useful response. Patients are delighted to have something else, our stuck patients, where nothing else seems to be helping. Uh, here's something else that they can try, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to prescribe. So an audit uh, uh, supported by uh, Professor Bruce Arrell and uh, our medical student, uh, uh, we've looked at uh, my prescriptions for uh, last year and uh, we found adverse effects in around 10%, but we're really looking at minor adverse effects. Sedation actually for those in uh, chronic pain, sedation can be a really good adverse effect to have. Vivid dreams, uh, some have reported that positively. They've been delighted to dream uh, for the first time in many years. Irritability, disorientation, these are small numbers really. Uh, nausea, diarrhea, mouth irritation, and most find that they either are temporary or uh, are minor irritation. The dose needed, well, anywhere from 40 to 300 milligrams per day. Uh, I often find that 100 milligrams a day is effective for a lot of people. Actually, people are not wanting to pay more than that very often. My follow-up rate um, uh, I've looked at and uh, uh, I've uh, found uh, uh, that uh, uh, I've been able to uh, get an idea uh, from 56% uh, of my patients uh, and uh, uh, they'll uh, uh, be according to that first chart that we saw earlier that uh, really are around a quarter to a third uh, getting very good to excellent response. And sure, that's uh, just after the first three or four weeks. But in medicine, that's a pretty good starter and uh, it's very encouraging. So I've been to a lot of workshops uh, and I've got a lot of experts uh, that I wish to, to thank uh, on this. And uh, really uh, invite you to think of medicinal cannabis if you've got any patients who are stuck and uh, to get back to us with uh, any questions that you've got. And uh, through my uh, website or email, uh, I certainly take uh, a lot of questions and uh, uh, up and down the country, I'm happy to provide video consultations with a report back to GPs. And I think some GPs are finding that uh, having me see a couple of patients uh, on their behalf and I'll write back to you as GPs and, uh, and I'll give you every bit of encouragement to continue successful prescriptions and to get started yourself. Uh, I take a lot of questions from GPs because uh, once you've done a few, it's fairly easy and while it doesn't work for everyone, uh, those patients who do benefit uh, will thank you uh, immensely for the effort that you've put into prescribing medicinal cannabis to them. Great, thank you, Graham. We've got plenty of time for questions. We've got quite a few that have come up on our board and some of these questions have been actually answered during the talk. Uh, would you like to go through some questions? Mm, mm. Okay, all right. Um, we've got an interesting question here. We've got someone who is an occupational health nurse and part of their job entails drug and alcohol testing for pre-employment and um, other causes. The question is, can the CBD be detected in urine? I suspect that there are different drug testing kits that test for different items and uh, I think that they're mainly metabolites of THC so the patient on CBD is unlikely to have a positive but uh, I'm always prepared as a prescriber to write a letter to mm -hmm. say that this patient is on cannabidiol CBD uh, which is the non-euphoriant component of cannabis. And I don't think that there's a risk of dependence or impairment from CBD. Uh, some studies have shown that uh, CBD may trigger some urine drug screens. Uh, I think we deal with that uh, if it comes up, but uh, I think that's an unusual situation. Okay, all right. There's a question here with regards to hemp oil, and someone was wondering if hemp oil is similar to CBD. Well, uh, 
Yes, what, uh, what do we mean by hemp oil? Uh, hemp uh, seed oil uh, is uh, in theory not going to contain the cannabinoids uh, THC and CBD mm -hmm. uh, which are for medicinal use and uh, so uh, people do tell me that they try that and they enjoy it and uh, uh, you know I think it's a, a healthy food supplement but they're probably not going to get the medicinal benefits that they would from prescribed cannabidiol, CBD, mm -hmm. or tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, THC, or, or that combination uh, that uh, I've mentioned, which is the Sativex spray. Okay, all right. Now, we've got a question coming in from someone who has a patient taking Colorado CBD oil for pain, which she seems to find effective but she also seems to be experiencing euphoria. How much do you know about this particular product? Right, well, it's uh, interesting. Uh, some people do import medicinal cannabis products and uh, uh, it's illegal to export them from the USA. And sometimes people get away with that for a few times, mm -hmm. uh, bringing them in, and then they get a letter from customs to say, uh, that uh, we're holding uh, and until we get a, a standard prescription to cover your importation. Okay. So uh, from the USA, uh, you may not be able to import. With the doctor's letter, you may be able to import from other countries, but the USA has got its strange regulations. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to the question then. So the question was with regards to Colorado CBD oil, right. which she found useful for her pain relief but she was experiencing some euphoria. Right. Well, what we also are finding is that people are sometimes getting it in from the USA, mm -hmm. but uh, it's often labelled in a bland sort of way or nondescript sort of way that doesn't really tell us the amounts of right. uh, the constituents in it. Whereas uh, if I'm prescribing CBD, uh, so this is the, the only one that we've got here at the moment, and uh, so it uh, uh, comes in a couple of strength and, and uh, I'm prescribing the uh, CBD 100 milligrams per mil. Very easy numbers to work with, uh, easy for the patients. It comes in a dropper bottle and uh, the pharmacy has to get that in and the dropper is marked and the patients uh, can uh, take that, uh, hold it under the tongue before they swallow it. That's the CBD and pretty much the only other product that we have is the Sativex spray and uh, so uh, that uh, uh, needs to be on a controlled drug form whereas the CBD can be on a standard prescription form and the Sativex spray which is a, a balanced mix of THC and CBD and uh, so the Sativex uh, comes as a sublingual spray, this one's empty, so spray it under the mouth and uh, so uh, that comes as a pack of three uh, that uh, requires the special application form that I've mentioned earlier. Okay, we've got an interesting question coming in. Uh, a comment that CBD can be mood stabilizing and someone wondering how about its potential to assist withdrawal from pathological cannabis use. Well, I suspect it could be. Uh, and so uh, CBD uh, is the non-euphoriant part of cannabis. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it uh, may be a helpful item. There, we've just lost our Sorry. screen here. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so what else does this person want to know? Um, I think you've had a comment with regards to its use, uh, with regards to getting someone off pathological or illicit drug use, basically. Right. And sadly, a lot of people will tell you that uh, it's much cheaper to buy illicit cannabis uh, uh, than prescription medicine. But uh, there are those who can afford it and are desperate and, and would like a controlled medicine. And the, the thing about illicit drugs is we don't know the content and uh, you can't easily get them analysed or legally get them analysed without drawing attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and so some would prefer to switch to uh, proper prescription CBD 
And uh, at least with this, it's standardized. Mm. It's the same dose over and over. And uh, when you're buying on the black, or should I say green market, uh, people don't know what they get. The consistency of the product can vary. Okay. Um, there is a question coming in with regards to your experience of using CBD for uh, palliative purposes. What have you found when you've been using it in practice? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people uh, at the end of their lives and uh, they are often having adverse mm -hmm. effects from chemotherapy or don't tolerate mm -hmm. the standard analgesics uh, and uh, are very hopeful too that there might be some anti-tumor benefits from medicinal cannabis. Mm -hmm. Now there is a lot of research showing that uh, medicinal cannabis can have anti-tumor properties uh, but uh, the, the studies are, are not uh, that reliable at the moment. But if, if uh, re reducing your cancer is a side effect of taking a spray or drops that uh, might reduce your nausea, might improve your appetite, mm -hmm. might reduce your pain, might help you sleep, uh, a whole range of things. So certainly in uh, cancer care, uh, I'm very keen to prescribe mm -hmm. it and many people report benefit uh, and if a side effect of treatment is a reduction in the cancer, well, we'll take it, won't sure. we? But uh, look, there's no guarantee and I do like to be clear about mm -hmm. that with patients. Okay, okay. Uh, there's some questions coming through with regards to the use of CBD in conjunction with other pain relief medications such as trimadol or something a little bit stronger like morphine. Is this something that you'd prescribe in combination commonly or is yeah. it one after the Look, other? Yeah, yeah, when I start people on CBD, which is uh, what we've got here, uh, I tell them, look, at first, this is the only change. Add this to your regime and uh, continue with your other medications. But uh, typically people will come back and they'll say that they've uh, reduced their morphine or, or there are other analgesics, uh, uh, if people start to feel better, they'll stop these stronger drugs. Uh, others will find that uh, this will work in a different way mm. and that they'll add it to their standard regimen. Okay. Does the CBD have the capacity to induce um, the hepatic enzymes in terms of induction? Uh, what we find is that people usually uh, build up to reach a steady level and can stay at that level. Uh, in theory, some people need to have a, a brief drug holiday uh, to uh, recover the full benefits, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of people find that they can just uh, continue at a steady dose. And actually, I, I think that uh, uh, medicinal cannabis uh, often helps to reset uh, things like chronic pain mm. and over time people are reporting that they're able to gradually reduce the dose of medicinal cannabis that they're Great. taking. Okay, yeah. okay. Now, you had a commentary with regards to using CBD for PMS and someone was wondering whether or not to use it in a cyclical fashion or if you use it intermittently. Right, yeah, a lot of people ask, can they use it as a PRN medication? My impression is that we need to use it preferably three or four times a day. So while I showed you a twice daily schedule, I think it works better if uh, we do break it up into three or four times a day. And that might be a quarter of a mil, 25 milligrams QID, just build up to that and then uh, you may find that you start to get some benefits. Okay, fantastic. All right, do you know of any nurse practitioners prescribing in New Zealand? Uh, it's a standard legal prescription. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, the regulations about nurses and prescribing. Okay, okay. Now there is some commentary on some papers uh, from um, medical cannabis and different organisations, which is, it's a little bit wordy, but let's see if I can pull something out from it. There was a study in the Lancet, um, which someone has commented that found that cannabis use was ineffective for pain, uh, could be worse. Do you think there was a design problem? Now the paper they're referencing, the questions over here, is uh, Campbell et al. published in 2018. Are you aware of that paper? 
Well, call me old fashioned. I'm a GP. I talk to my patients. Sure. I ask them what they're doing. And yeah, let's ask our patients, are you using cannabis in any form? And uh, if we don't ask, uh, uh, we won't know. Mm -hmm. And patients are relieved to be able to have this discussion. And we'll find a, a, a great number of patients are out there and they'll tell you of the benefit or different batches give different results. So uh, look, I think we need to talk to our patients and uh, I, I see patients for a follow-up visit. I'm really keen to find out if this has helped or not, if we need to modify the way they take it. And uh, uh, yes, I, I read the literature, I, I've done the training, but uh, I also think uh, as a uh, primary care physicians, we listen to our patients and uh, uh, there are always exceptions to the, the standard uh, studies and uh, look, uh, patients deserve the opportunity for something that's so benign, that's got so few side effects. Uh, if you're desperate and uh, if you're having problems with standard treatments and uh, the, the side effects of uh, gabapentin and the opioids and uh, the tricyclics for your chronic pain, then you may want to try something that's likely to have far fewer side effects. Uh, the main uh, side effect is financial, and mm. uh, that, that's a bit sad. Okay, okay. Now, we've got a little question that's a bit more of a, a, a case question. So someone's got a patient with chronic neck pain who is a regular user of recreational cannabis, which he claimed is for pain relief as well. He's asked me to prescribe the medicinal cannabis uh, which that a doctor doesn't have any experience with. Would this be a patient that is a candidate for CBD oil? Yeah, uh, sometimes I'm curious that patients uh, want to stop their illicit cannabis because uh, uh, it probably contains a lot more uh, THC uh, and uh, that is likely to be a lot more potent than the plain CBD that we can prescribe. But for those uh, who want to make the switch because uh, this is standardized, it's legal, it's reliable, uh, then uh, uh, I think uh, we can certainly uh, write the prescription for the CBD and uh, give it a go. Okay, okay. Uh, just a question which I'm not too sure whether it would be easy for you just to email a response, but we'll have a go. It's just the technical question of loading on a prescription on MedTech. Is that easy to describe in the context of this webinar or is that a question that's easy to answer by email or contacting you directly? Loading new items onto MedTech is challenging <laughs> and because uh, most of my work uh, is uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, I've certainly loaded it. Uh, I continue to do my work as an addiction specialist and uh, as a GP, uh, but uh, really uh, I've got, oh, Sativex is in your mm. uh, medical database but uh, yes I know GPs who hand write their CBD scripts because it's easier or I've uh, set up an item called the prescription that I can uh, write uh, anything in the SIG box uh, or uh, I, I guess MedTech can talk you through it and uh, it's a nightmare adding new items to MedTech. Uh, how sad is that? Uh, just a few final questions here. Someone's wondering about um, the impact of C CBD on the ability to drive for the patient after they take it. Well, I think it's non-intoxicating. It's non-euphoriant. Uh, it's the tetrahydrocannabinol, that's uh, uh, THC, uh, uh, tetrahydrocannabidiol, that uh, is uh, more of a risk. Uh, but I tell people to be cautious. Uh, generally, we start with a dose of this uh, that uh, people would uh, take by dropper, uh, hold it under the tongue for as long as you can before you swallow it to improve the absorption. You might get a little bit of sublingual. Uh, oral absorption is very poor, probably no more than 10 or 20%, so at great expense, it's going right through you. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, well worth... Uh, trying uh, the, the oral dose like that and, and seeing what benefit you get. Okay. And with a condition, for example, like insomnia, would you um, treat the individual on a VD basis or would you consider just not day dosing? I think uh, um, twice to four times a day. Okay. Look, I think most conditions come in 
um, groups, don't they, in bunches. So anyone with uh, depression is likely to have some insomnia and there may be some pain and other things. And uh, I think uh, uh, medicinal cannabis is non-judgmental. Uh, uh, it, uh, if we go back to the endocannabinoid system, it's involved with balance with keeping things back in the, the, the normal zone there. And what we're doing is supporting a, a kind of homeostasis. And so I think uh, uh, problems often come in multiples. And uh, I start uh, out by uh, giving the doses two to four times a day and think getting an even level. And then because it's expensive, people will naturally reduce and find their own level. Our final question that we'll take tonight um, for this webinar, someone's just written a commentary with regards to being told by a representative by Helios Therapeutics that in an interview with the Ministry of Health, they were in the process of writing regulations, uh, further regulations for prescribing medicinal cannabis. Given that it's currently available to be prescribed, what exactly, in your opinion, do you think the Ministry of Health is going to be writing about? The only product we've got at the moment is from Tilray in Canada. Uh, as I've said, the, the USA is not able to export uh, medicinal cannabis products. And so uh, until the New Zealand products are grown and have gone through the basic research, uh, uh, at, at best we're looking at one year uh, I'm, I suspect uh, it'll be a couple of years before it goes through the whole process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, we can prescribe, patients can import overseas product, but right now uh, we've only got one product and uh, ask your pharmacy about it. They order it in. It won't be on the shelf at the pharmacy. It has to be ordered in per prescription. Uh, we're going to see a wider range of products in future okay. and I look forward to that because it's going to be of better service to patients. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Graham, for walking us through medical cannabis and demystifying the process with regards to the indications and practical tips on prescribing. A copy of this webinar will be available uh, on our website in due course in fairly short uh, order of things. And any resources and Graham's contact details will also be available there as well. Thank you very much and good night.